Snail's pace. Our souls cling to sanctuary, to its gravel, gum, shattered glass, and pavement, while races on our left the devil's light trails, horns ablaze with right of way. Right away, this image reads like Bosch, reads like after the fall. While we try not to fall, our desperate hands come across a painting on a wall, the first of the triptych, our usual ditch inverted, walking. We cry at the past and the shadow it casts. That's really good. It's one of my favorite poems so far for the Degrowth series, I think. Thank you. It was inspired by things have gotten snowy and icy here in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And on the topic of walkability, we like to think this place, oh, it's so nice. We can walk everywhere. It's very dense. But the sidewalks in some areas are just on an angle inclined towards the road. Mm. So when there's ice, we had this revelation, revelation the other night that if you slip, you just die. Yeah, you just fall into the road, <laughs> yeah. basically. Also, I find walking around here, there's a lot of parts of the sidewalks that are just underwater if it rains. Yeah. Because of the way that they kind of slope down for people's driveways and stuff. So, despite all of our praise of the Montreal infrastructure... Still some work to be done. Some work to be done. Definitely. So, last week's question concerning walkability was what type of infrastructure catalyzes the walkability of a city or encourages walkability is that correct yeah it was like how can we make the existing infrastructure more walkable mm -hmm. so it's not exactly about building new cities mm. because we think that's an important distinction i know it might be a little bit semantic but when people talk about degrowth or sustainable futures often it's about new things how do we build green cities mm -hmm. it's like well it's not really about building cities. It's about mm -hmm. changing cities to be more green, which, yeah, it seems pedantic, but that's actually a pretty big difference when you're thinking about planning. Well, yeah, because you have to work within the confines of the existing infrastructure and retrofit it to suit the needs of the future. Exactly. So with regards to the existing infrastructure, I started by just listing some issues when okay. it comes to walkability, because we have now lived in a pretty rural place and also a pretty urban place. Mm -hmm. So I like to think we've kind of got both those bases covered. Yeah. So I listed some of the issues for rural living and when it comes to walkability, which are primarily the distance between things. Yes. That's the most obvious one. Yeah. Things are just too far away for it to be efficient to walk there mm -hmm. remotely. Car culture slash peer pressure. Yeah. Which is especially an issue in rural areas. I know that's the case everywhere. Yeah, Like everywhere course. there's a kind of elitism when it comes down to walking. Mm -hmm. Everywhere in our culture is, which is North America. But especially in rural places, when you're growing up, the car is like the symbol of autonomy, individuality, maturity. Getting your license and getting your first car is a giant rite of passage. Mm. And that's just the done thing. Yes. That's just what it is. And the other issue, a small one, and when it comes to walkability in rural areas, no sidewalks. Yeah, you have to just walk along the, the side of the road. Yeah. <laughs> and no one's used to people walking as well. So you just always basically can feel the wind of the cars yeah. as they pass by you. You feel the wind and you feel the hatred from the driver. Mm. Because rural drivers don't like people who walk. Yeah. Or ride bikes. Yes. Um, when it comes to urban living and walkability, primary concerns I could think of were that it's also unsafe in a different way because there's just so many more cars, yes. I would say, and often a lot of things. Of course, the sidewalk infrastructure is usually better than rural areas, but it's often blocked. Very often. Still a lot yeah. of issues. Another issue is whenever you have to leave the city, mm -hmm. you can't really walk, so you need a car. Yeah. And another issue I found, this is a bit more of a uh, contributing factor than a symptom, I suppose. It's a bit of a different stage in the conversation, but... When I was looking into walkability in urban areas, and it seems so simple for us as outside outsiders not working in community design or urban design mm -hmm. or politics to say, well, we should do this, this, this. But a giant hurdle in making cities more walkable is all the regulations and zoning mm -hmm. and uh, safety requirements. For instance, fire trucks. Yes. A big thing I guess I learned in the last week is that North American fire trucks tend to be much bigger than European ones. Ah, I see. Which I didn't realize, but so when they are 
designing streets, they have to keep these giant behemoths in mind. Mm -hmm. And they're like, legally has to be certain things, which I suppose seem to go against walkability. Mm -hmm. A few other issues with walkability that I noted while preparing for this is that living in a city is quite expensive. Mm. So say I don't want to drive. I just want to walk my whole life. You have to live in a city in yeah. the current situation, but it's really expensive. So the farther out of central walkable zones, the cheaper the housing. So often in order to be able to afford housing, people have to live in these urban sprawl, more rural, yeah. or even just suburban neighborhoods. That fits really well into this overall trend under degrowth, which is that people are being priced out of authentic living, slow mm -hmm. living or connection to the world, things like that. Yeah. It's like, well, it's, it would be nice to live in a really walkable place, but most people can't afford that. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that sounds like a hilarious statement. Most people can't afford to walk, mm -hmm. to work, but it's true. Like in surveys and stuff, 60% of millennials and like people our age as well said they would rather live in a walkable city. And then for, even 40% of boomer older people said that they'd rather live in a walkable city. So it's like something everybody wants. Well, that's not about everybody. half of people. But like something that like a <laughs> chunk of people want. Yeah. But then there's not really much striving for it because of the things like the fire trucks and just there's a lot of things we take for granted that we haven't tried to rethink. Yeah, I just want to mention a few more issues. Mm -hmm. These are things that I think equally affect rural living and urban living when it comes to walkability. Weather, which we yeah. noted last week, is a mess. Um, carrying things mm -hmm. is uh, a struggle. Yes. And also just convenience and ease. Like it's quite rare that whether you're in a rural place or an urban place, it's actually quicker to walk somewhere. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's always easier to drive. Yeah. The interesting thing that I've found since we lived in Montreal is that it's when you look at like Google Maps for say I'm going from here to an, the grocery store, biking is almost always the fastest. Yeah, biking is the fastest. Which is really interesting. And I know it's, it's an episode on biking, but... But walking and driving are about similar yeah and especially walking to a grocery store in a city might be about the same as driving to a grocery store in a rural town mm -hmm. which i think is is rather interesting because when you consider that the time is effectively the same mm -hmm. it really comes down to your preference yeah the thing with walking is that i think people who walk as their primary mode of transport i'm pretty sure they take double the amount of trips to the grocery store to the bank to whatever because even as you just said, carrying, like you can't yeah. carry a week's worth of groceries and toilet paper and all the things you need in one trip like you could in a car. Yeah, I mean, we try. We try our best. We see some innovative methods like those little buggies people push mm -hmm. around. Yeah. Have you ever heard of Jeff Speck? That's a really familiar name, <laughs> but I don't know who he is. He wrote about walkable cities and he oh, had yes. this, this general theory of walkability, which I think is, a, is kind of a funny name. And he said that a, a successful walk has to satisfy four conditions. Useful, safe, comfortable, and interesting. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about that and I was like, it sounds so funny to try and measure a walk like that. Yeah. It's, it's just walking. But I guess when you're on a mass scale and you're talking about a million people or 15 million people mm -hmm. and you're trying to design something to be walkable, you have to do it in a kind of scientific way. So we could break all four of these down, I guess. Useful, I suppose, refers to density, refers mm -hmm. to the walk for it to be successful and appealing should achieve something. Mm -hmm. It should take you to the laundromat, to the store, to your friend's house, to your school, mm -hmm. and not just be a walk. Yes. I mean, I like those just walks, but that's not really what we're talking about today. Yeah, we're talking more about the practical yeah. elements of walking. Safe. Cars. Cars are really the enemy. Yeah, I, um, when I was reading about the safety of walkability, it was really funny because I was reading a lot of articles and studies by very obvious car-first groups, car-friendly mm -hmm. groups, who were like, well, driving so much safer. Mm -hmm. And I was like, do you know why? <laughs> do you know why walking isn't safe? It's because of the cars. Yeah. I it's, saw a lot of people saying like one of the big issues with walking is just you have to wait at stoplights for like minutes. <laughs> Cause like I was trying to get somewhere really quickly earlier this morning and I was like, okay, I can literally see where I'm going, but there were like three sets of lights. Yes. So it's like, it's going to take me way longer than it would have if there weren't cars and I could just walk. Yeah. 
it reminds me a little bit of when people in cars complain about the traffic. Mm -hmm. It's like, you're the traffic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's safety. I guess we don't really want to talk about how to make car cities more safe for pedestrians. No. We want to talk about car-free cities. <laughs> yeah. And I guess safety wouldn't be much of an issue there. Mm -hmm. There's still emergency vehicles. Yeah. I don't think cities could, should be or could be car-free. Fire trucks, as I mentioned, ambulances, police cars, buses, mm -hmm. trams, all of these are, are all potential safety hazards. Mm -hmm. But if the vehicle count on the roads is reduced that so much, mm -hmm. you got to think things will be safer. Yeah, for sure. Comfortable. What's your take on that? The first thing that comes to my mind is sound. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It's loud sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I was talking on the phone while walking yesterday and I was like, oh my, like, cause you notice it when you're walking, but when you're on the phone, especially it's like, I'm sorry that you can't hear me right now. I'm outside. Why is it so loud outside? Because of those stupid, I really don't like when people don't have the mufflers on their cars. Nothing, literally nothing bothers me more than that. But in addition, it's just loud. Yeah, it's also, obnoxious. The comfort comes from weather as well a bit. Of course. And I'll get into that with the solutions. I have a lot of ideas for more comfortable walking conditions. And yeah, just the sidewalks are a mess sometimes. It would be nice if they were wider, that's for sure. Yeah, when you're like trying to scoop by people, there's people waiting at the bus stop and you're like, well, I guess I have to walk on the road or push my way through this crowd. Yeah, <laughs> and interesting. Mm -hmm. I suppose... What I think about interesting is that where I used to live, I would take a walk pretty much every day or every other day, mm -hmm. and it'd be the exact same, to the exact same place. Mm -hmm. So it would take exactly 20 minutes. I'd turn around another 20 minutes home, and I'd very rarely see anybody. Mm -hmm. Nothing would change except the leaves, Yeah, which was nice in its own way. But I think what makes things interesting is people you see because people change things. People change buildings, people open businesses, people sing on the street. Mm -hmm. I think they do that, don't they? Yeah, they do. People walk their dogs. Yeah. So this is about density as well as beautiful buildings. That's yeah. what makes things interesting. Like caring about your neighborhood. So it's like if everyone was walking everywhere, I'm sure there'd be more interesting street art even. Like I don't love graffiti, but I do like when there's nice art installations and yeah, that's cool an interesting, posters. That's an interesting thought because... We often lament the ugliness of new architecture, mm -hmm. new cities. And there's this idea that that's because it's old cities were designed to be looked at all the time because all people ever did was walk around them. Mm -hmm. Now people drive through them. So what's the point in making things look nice? Yeah. One of the pivotal moments in my history, in my experience, was this one class in first year of university where they were talking about the era in between like the era right before cars, basically, where urban planning was like really, really big and yeah. everyone was really into it. And they were talking about, it was referencing these old textbooks and these old images that were drawn up of like walkable cities because mm -hmm. that was what people thought the future was, was making things more dense, more accessible. And the way they would design these streets was so beautiful to me because they would always be lined with trees for shade, for shade from the weather as well. Like you're not going to get rained on if there's, really dense trees and I remember even my hometown like the street I lived on used to be perfect a perfect example of that it was a nice wide like sidewalks with these trees covering it but then there was this decision oh the trees are getting a bit too much so they just cut them all down <laughs> because they were like hindering the wires or whatever and it's like had those trees been there so many of my walks home from school wouldn't have been in the slush pouring down from the sky like the trees would have kind of helped me out with that <laughs> that's true that's true yes but definitely look into old like urban planning if you're interested in more ideas about walkable streets because it's pre-car yeah it's very beautiful pre-stink chariot mm -hmm. um, another little term i found for measuring walkability is the three d's density diversity layout mm -hmm. layout starts with an l never mind and <laughs> <laughs> I was like, layout, and I was trying to figure out what you said. <laughs> Start with the D. Diversity means that you don't just live in the business district, the mm -hmm. school district, because those really only work with cars. Yes. 
you live in a place that has a school, a bakery, a deli, mm -hmm. a prison. I don't know. I'm just listing things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what else? Well, you'd want a pharmacy, yeah. hardware store. Of course. Clothing stores. Yes. Yeah, I always get frustrated when it's like, I'm going to go for coffee. But it's like, but I also have to go another kilometer to get to the grocery store and then another kilometer to get to the bookstore. So right. it's like, uh, I wish things weren't organized kind of the way that they are. Yeah, so that the good thing about um, diversity is that it can change pretty quickly. You see that yeah. with gentrification. Things can change within a span of five to ten years mm -hmm. for the better or for the worse. And density can also change very quickly. Mm -hmm. Layout, of course, cannot change so quickly. Yes. And that's what I think a lot of people take issue with the grid cities. Mm -hmm. But I would argue there's there's probably very few layouts that are inherently absolutely unwalkable. Yeah. I know there's a lot of adverbs, but even if something's the most boring grid and um, designed for cars city there is, mm -hmm. if you put it in the hands of Dr. Seuss, mm -hmm. he would make it look really pink and blue yeah. and crazy. Exactly. I'm not saying Dr. Seuss should be designing the cities. I'm saying that you can always take the skeleton of something mm -hmm. and envision it to be more anything, basically. Yeah, and if people just started walking more, like if there was a mandate, you can only drive your cars on Tuesdays. Oh, jeez. Like the stores that maybe they only sold books and that was like the only store in your town. I'm sure they'd quickly start selling groceries and then up above them where there used to be an apartment, maybe that would open up into a pharmacy like things would adapt really quickly i think and unfortunately that actually is an issue with walkability because as cities go up one walkability point rent increases 600 to 13,000 i think dollars a month that's how attractive walkability is but it causes gentrification because it's so rare so it's like oh this city's getting more walkable but then the rent goes up and no one can <laughs> access it anymore yeah i mean we're like the prime uh culprits for that yeah because we effectively moved to montreal because it's the one place in canada <laughs> and you might even argue north america that is um somewhat affordable for the time being mm -hmm. and also walkable yeah <laughs> the one the one city yeah do you want to get into some solutions i'd love to i have some cool ideas okay i'm going to take your first idea which Go is um, changing roads mm -hmm. to be little areas of growing. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to give it to you to explain. You really it. stole that idea. Yeah, I stole that idea oh my goodness. directly from you. <laughs> okay. So I had the idea that, well, we're going to cut down cars. By the way, I looked it up and you didn't come up with this idea. That's a, it's already a thing. So I think you stole it from some project which is already happening. I did not. And you tried to pass it off as your own. No. I wonder how often you've done that on this podcast. <laughs> Sometimes we come up with ideas that are good ideas and other people have had them. Sure. Okay, anyway, the idea is that we turn roads into farms. It's such a beautiful idea. And not all of them, because as we said, we still want buses and bikes. But you can have farms, then you just walk between the roads. They're still accessible for people on foot. Yeah. And even you could bike the roads, but like, we don't have to grow forests on them, but we could in some areas. And then other places, yeah, community gardens. Could also be flowers. Yeah. I'm not envisioning this in a dense city so much because I would just like to open those roads up to walk on, to be mm -hmm. honest, for the most part. More in rural places or really highway dependent cities mm -hmm. where there's long stretches. Yeah. That's what I envision it as. Mm -hmm. And where otherwise people wouldn't be walking. Yeah. Kind of, kind of like that. Yeah, I think it's a great way to beautify cities, but also just really practically carbon fixing and like cement roads are just bad for the environment because they trap heat and they obviously concrete has really bad impacts on the environment. Yeah, I was looking into this because I was wondering about parking lots. Mm. Such a big use of space. Did you have any ideas for them? I would just rewild parking lots, I think, for the most part. There's such a big use of space in cities. Um, I have this stat that there's three to eight parking spots. It's hard to do the numbers, I can imagine, for every vehicle in the world that's on the mm. road. Um, and there's about 1.4 billion cars on the road yeah. in the world. That's like at least 4 billion mm -hmm. parking spots. Insane. Yeah. Of course. But I was wondering about the actual efficacy of, it's easy to say, oh, turn that into a forest, turn mm -hmm. that into a garden. But 
of growing in a parking lot. Yeah. And there are some people doing studies on it. And the basically the two methods are either depaving, mm-hmm. tearing up the asphalt. Yeah. Which is kind of hard to do. Yeah. I mean, I imagine the soil is also kind of really dense underneath there now. Yeah. The soil, of course, it's not very good growing soil. Mm-hmm. Or using pots. Yeah. So none of those sound ideal to me. No. I think it could be used in some places, but not as a blanket solution. Yeah. I'm thinking about like the big parking spots outside of a Walmart Mm -hmm. or a grocery store. And those also, speaking about zoning, those are also mandated Mm -hmm. that for every, for your capacity in your Walmart, you have to have this many parking seats. Yeah. You never see a full parking lot. No, it's never. That's the crazy thing about it. Yeah. So maybe that can be a small question for next week. Mm, What to do with parking lots? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. One of my solutions that I had was kind of practical. It was like how to adapt the infrastructure. But I mean, you know, when you're walking and you're like, I just need to use the bathroom. I just need a drink. I'm starving. It's true. It's true. Well, I've never been starving. but I get like really hungry sometimes when I'm walking like this morning. I really needed to eat, but I didn't want to go to a restaurant. So it would have been nice if there was just like rest areas, places with water fountains and public restrooms that you don't have to go in and pay. Like that'd be lovely. And I know there are public restrooms and fountains, but they're usually not well maintained or they're just too far apart. Yeah, or they're closed permanently. Yeah. So I think that would be really, really useful to encouraging walkability, be having those public spaces. And kind of going off of that, more shade. And we talked about it last week a little bit, tunnels, walkways, <laughs> because when it's really hot out and you're walking like an hour, you just would like some shade sometimes. And there's really none because of the way streets are laid out. So yeah, it's some little, they could be like permanent little kind of swoop sun things. And then they would also be useful in the winter and in the rain. So it's true. We were also talking that maybe people should bring back parasols. Mm-hmm. I guess that's neither here nor there though. Yeah, but people could. It's hard in the wind, but in some places. One more policy solution I had is more government jobs for beautification, Mm -hmm. referring to snow clearing. Yeah. And street sweeping even. Yeah. Because where we live, pretty much in the middle of one of the sidewalks, there's just been shattered glass Mm -hmm. for three or four weeks. Yeah. But I imagine it's no one's job to move it. Yeah. So that would be nice. That would be nice, wouldn't it? One thing that I wrote down was shortcuts. And that kind of goes along with interesting walks because you really do take the same route every day. Yeah. But when there's shortcuts, which there are a lot of in Montreal, I've found little alleyways for walking and biking, but not so much in other places. You know, when it's frustrating, I'm going right there, but you'd have to walk through people's yards and stuff. But if there were like designated shortcuts, it'd be fun. (laughs) And you could like kind of switch it up. I don't know if it's... um. (laughs) I feel like designated shortcuts is kind of an oxymoron, but yeah, that's a, <laughs> it's definitely a nice idea. Like, Hog- like Hogwarts, all the different secret passages they have. Yeah, because they don't have to all be roads and these wide, like, pavilion, beautiful streets. like Underground areas. Underground. I'd take an alley here or there. Like, it's just for fun. <laughs> Zip lines. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just random walls that have, like... Uh, Rock climbing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Just put up hand, a fence. Hand grips so on. So you have to go over it. <laughs> That's not exactly what I mean, but like just some. Or ropes dangling. Yeah. A cavern. <laughs> 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 All our ideas are actually just making the city less walkable. Yeah. <laughs> but we're giving it more challenges and therefore more fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, moats with alligators in because you yeah. have to traverse them. Mm-hmm. The main idea for walkability, I mean, it's fun to get creative and try Mm -hmm. and be ingenuitive. But really, the core of everything I was reading seemed to point to small business. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit of a feedback loop because the more walkable things are, the more places will open because Mm -hmm. the more shoppers there are. But also, the more stores there are, the more people will be walking, Mm -hmm. which is which is uh, a conundrum for sure. Mm -hmm. But I like this quote that you can measure walkability by counting the number of people on the street who are sitting or standing still. And it occurs to me that really the the only places like that that I would say are truly walkable uh, that I've been on, campuses Mm -hmm. and parks. And um, there are some streets in London, I remember when we went there, that are very walkable. 
I mean, of course, this is very weather dependent as well. Yeah. But a lot of main streets, when they close down the cars, mm -hmm. those are when you're on them, you just think to yourself, oh, yeah, this is what, this is how it should be. Yeah. Yeah, there was a main street nearby us that had like a sandbox in the summer. It had obviously tables with little umbrellas and everything, but it had little activities and it's fun. Like people would stop and play. London's a good example. Like I know it's obviously probably a really common example, but I forgot. Like they have so many parks. Yes. So it's like you can, that's kind of the shortcuts idea of like, it's not actually a shortcut. It might be a long cut. But that was the most fun kind because you yeah. think that you're saving minutes. Really mm -hmm. you're not. No. <laughs> but it's nice. Yeah. So it's not about time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, small business, it effectively is the antidote to, or I guess it was the, the victim of business parks, mm -hmm. which are really our enemy. Yes. Business parks referring to just these really large, out of the way uh, corporate hellscapes. I don't really know how to d define it other than that. What would you say? No. No, that's fair. Like if someone didn't know what a business park was or had never been there, how would you just describe it in plain terms? It seems like a mock-up okay. that an AI would have made of like a mall. If you said make a mall cover 15 acres. Yeah, and have most of it be parking lots. Yeah, and all the stores just blown up and they have like, for some reason, just four stories of empty space above the main floor. Like or or just... no stories at all. Yeah. It's just one really really long story mm -hmm. like when we see walmarts yeah we're like wait why is this just so long mm -hmm. why is the footprint so big but it can't go up mm -hmm. i'm sure there's reasons zoning reasons and things like that yeah but those are the kind of ridiculous reasons i think need to go and i understand that there's a lot of people who are um i might be arguing with the straw man here but there's a lot of people who are against high rises and skyscrapers mm -hmm. i get that and they think it it uh, destroys the fabric of the city or whatever because i think a lot of those big glass office buildings are ugly as well yeah. and apartments but there there isn't in between between yes. business parks um really large footprint buildings that only have one thing in them mm -hmm. and say three or four story apartment buildings yeah you can have some height yeah without it being hideous yeah i think height's cool sometimes but like not when you're walking down one of those streets and there's just you can't see light except for like at the end of the tunnel <laughs> Like a little bit of variation is important. Another issue I always encounter when it comes to walkability that I think car fiends tend to, tend to really hang their hat on is this issue of freedom and individual liberty. So for instance, we're, we're effectively trying to paint a picture of the ideal world in which I won't say people aren't allowed to drive, but there's no infrastructure for people to drive mm -hmm. and therefore they're pretty much not allowed to drive. Yes. And people might say, that's not fair, that's, you know, it goes against our rights or whatever, it restricts our freedoms. But I think that there's a lot of our freedoms which we already restrict, mm -hmm. most societies do. The parallel that I wanted to mention was drugs. Okay. Cars are kind of like drugs. Okay. In that most reasonable people would agree that hard drugs are bad for society. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yes. And that's why we don't allow them. Mm -hmm. And not just we don't allow them, but governments don't make them and sell them. Yes. And um, even necessitate them. Mm -hmm. But with cars, I think that they are a similar negative on community, on health, on sustainability, on aesthetics, all the things that render a society nice mm -hmm. and functional over the long term. And yet governments do necessitate them and mm -hmm. subsidize them. Yeah, I read a stat that for every person who chooses to drive, it costs the government $9.20 versus if you chose to walk, it costs the government a penny. Yeah, but when we say it costs the government, it costs us. Exactly. And we fund like, the government. <laughs> yeah, so it's like walking is just literally more affordable. Yeah, that's, that's, people don't realize it because it's so ingrained, but mm -hmm. parking lots and highways take from your tax money a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, if the tax money was just, um, what do they say, externalized, so you paid it at the toll, mm -hmm. like if more highways were toll roads, mm -hmm. then uh, people would realize, I think, how much these costs per year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another thing about like driving is that it's just inaccessible for like huge groups of people age-wise. Like once you get older than a certain age, 
can't really drive anymore. When you're younger than 16, you can't drive. Oh, it's true. When you're, when you're um, 15 and you want to go to buy some noodles for yourself, yeah. you just can't. Yeah. Like you, you just can't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's just so many things that we're like, oh, yeah, obviously you can't get to the store. You're under 16. It's like, <laughs> why is that obvious? Like, I can have a job. Why can't I have? I don't think that 16 year olds should be having cars, but I mean, like, why is stuff so far apart and so, like, yeah, just not meant for humans to function, basically only meant for cars? I read this term, shared urban amenities, mm-hmm. um, which is pretty self explanatory. We do this with laundromats, mm-hmm. those are very accepted. Yeah. Grocery stores, I suppose, are a kind of shared urban amenity. But other places, I was reading about the city in Morocco that has a, sh- or a town in Morocco that has a shared oven. Yeah. So people make their dough at home, bring mm-hmm. it there to bake it. Bath houses, of course, we've espoused their benefits on the on the podcast before and will do in the future. This idea sounds very commune. Mm-hmm. So I don't exactly agree with it as a universal solution, but some places near us have tool rentals, right? Mm-hmm. And we think that's really fun. Yeah. Classes. Mm-hmm. Didn't you say there's a place you could rent art supplies? Yes, there is. You just sign up for like an hour slot and you go and you can do whatever you want. Shared urban amenities. Mm -hmm. You have to own less, Mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. Yeah. But already I can see people um, responding to this again, saying that it affects your individual liberties. Mm -hmm. I think people should be 100% in their rights to own an oven, own a bath, own paintbrushes, paints, Mm -hmm. of course. But I just think these are a neat idea that make people want to get out. I think so. More public spaces Mm -hmm. and more community, which is usually good. Yeah. And if like you knew about your coworkers who use the community oven, you feel like you're missing out by like not bringing your bread. Yeah, that's true. You'd be like, I want to go try out the community oven. You try it out and you'd be like, yeah, because you get to talk while it's cooking. It also doesn't have to be a single use space, right? It doesn't just have to be, this is a communal oven because that makes it sound a bit kind of culty. Yeah. But it could be an oven at a restaurant. Mm -hmm. That works. Yeah. Oh, we'll let you use our oven, basically. Mm-hmm. But it's just a tr- traditional restaurant aside from that. Mm-hmm. A lot of our solutions so far have worked or been directed more towards urban living. Mm-hmm. Any ideas for how to make rural places more walkable or are they just a lost cause? No, I think rural places have a lot of potential because they used to be walkable or at least That's didn't true. have to drive to the business park. That's true. Like I was working in this small rural area, basically... It's funny you mentioned the community oven because she, the girl we were working with, she quoted that case study. She's like, all I want is like a community oven for our community. And so basically they were reopening all of these old post office and bakery and so on because there's all the buildings in these rural areas. Like you think about even by your house, there were so many like just abandoned buildings that used to be the laundromat and the... Yeah, it's a wasteland. Yeah. So I think just reopening those spaces and then having accessible busing or trains to access can't necessarily have an ear, nose, and throat specialist in every single rural community. Of course. So there's, and there'll be centralized universities and stuff, but having trains for those, but having like the basics accessible. And I think it would just mean, yeah, reusing those old spaces that used to exist Mm. and opening new ones. The good thing about rural spaces is that there is space to build if you needed a new building. That's true. Increasing the density is of course important. Yeah. I really don't see a short-term walkability in most North American rural places mm-hmm. because when we say they used to be walkable, mm-hmm. a lot of them just didn't. A lot of them were built after cars, right? Yeah. Just as stops along a highway. Mm-hmm. So I think trains um, help these places a lot in replacing yeah. highways and making them connected to other cities. But my idea for this was a kind of Berenstain Bears, Franklin, Little Bear, the Shire vision in which there's a return to true rural living, which is more self-sufficiency. Yeah, you don't need to go to Costco. Yeah, you don't need to drive there. Yeah. Because if you want to live rurally, okay, there's your land. Mm -hmm. Kind of like that. Yeah. I would love that anyway. It'd be cool. Of course, that leads pretty well into talk about degrowth education. I think so. Which is our second question for today. There's a lot I have to say about this, I think. Okay. The question was, what should kids learn at home versus what should kids learn at school in school? And we're specifically talking about degrowth education. Yes. The biggest things that are missing from current education is where I think I'm going to start. 
we mentioned it last week, but education on the self. And I wanted to use the term self-study because that already has connotations. You do a self-study, you get to pick the animal that you're doing your science fair project on, you get to pick the history event you wanna discuss. But also, literally, like, this week, it's your goal to figure out your, your goals for the year. Just figure out your current best time on, like, reading or running or whatever it is. Yeah. I remember, sorry to hijack, I just want to mention. That's all right. I remember in high school, which it sounds like a funny high school assignment, but one of the assignments that stuck with me is in my, it was a class about Canadian history and we, we were learning about uh, First Nations vision quests, which is kind of like the mm -hmm. coming of age for adolescents and a lot of First Nations tribes and about how they would go into the forest and effectively hallucinate until they saw their spirit animal mm -hmm. and then they'd be like an adult for the tribe. So the teacher said, here's your assignment, find your spirit animal, make a piece of artwork for it and uh, explain why basically in a piece mm -hmm. of writing. And it sounds kind of new agey. Mm -hmm. Of course it does. But in this case, I think it, it served really well to, to drill in this concept about, you know, this historical or sociological concept, which otherwise I almost certainly wouldn't have remembered very yeah. well. <laughs> Mine was a squid for those who are wondering. Oh, okay. Yeah. We were all wondering. But I think that's something that massively lacks. And it probably lacks because those types of things were traditionally taught at home. Yeah. But in the current system, there isn't that much time to teach your kids at home. In the ideal world, in the degrown future, people work less. So there'll be a lot more time for parents to spend with their kids. And perhaps some of these things can translate back into the home. But I think in the transition, I put that in air quotes, a lot of parents wouldn't have had the experience. So how can they teach the kids? That's a good so point. So we need to educate the kids first and then slowly a bit more education will return to the home. But for me in the transition, it's going to put a lot of emphasis on public education so that it's accessible and equitable and like even because we don't want to just throw people in. Oh, from now on, you're going to learn your basics of literacy with your families. But then the families don't know how to do that. So we need to teach a generation or two how to do these things. And it's then true. It's true. shift it back to the home. A couple other things that currently lack from school education that we've talked about is food education. We did the food pyramid. Is that what it's called? Yes. But that's just inaccurate, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so it's like teaching kids how to eat, how to cook, macros, micros, the basics of like how we digest even. Okay. I think would be really useful. Yeah, I definitely think just health in general to a much greater degree than it is right now should be taught from a much younger age. Mm -hmm. When it comes to cooking though, I did most of my brainstorming for an ideal future, so not some uh, hypothetical transition period. But okay. I feel like that's something that should be taught at home. Yeah. Because when old people always say, oh, why are they learning about calculus when they don't even know how to cook or how to build or whatever? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, that was your job. Yeah. You should have taught them that. It's kind of, mm -hmm. I think anyway, that school should be more theoretical, academic, intellectual. Mm -hmm. Of course, it doesn't have to be less personalized or less about self. I think it should be more so, more psychological. Mm -hmm. You know, effectively, we're all academies of enlightenment. Yeah. But I think the, the skills of subsistence, cooking, mm -hmm building, growing, mm -hmm. I think those, uh, those hands-on skills in my ideal future are taught at home. Yeah, I agree. Well, not necessarily at, at home, but outside of school. Mm -hmm. Let me put it like that. I kind of broke down the types of things that I was trying to, when I was trying to categorize things into home, school, or both, or like both also kind of categorizes outside, Yeah, is things that should be taught in the home or things that are modeled. So like relationships, learning about culture and morals and security, care for others, care for animals, yeah. your sense of space, direction, and then like basics of instead of watching TV all day, you should be reading. Instead of never going for a walk, you should go for walks. So like things that are modeled can be taught at home. Behaviors. Yes. But then school is a lot more instruction and exploration. And exploration goes into the both category for me because I think home, you have so much time to explore. But in school, we need a little bit more exploration as well. You think school should have kitchens? Yeah. Okay, well, agree to disagree on that one, I guess. 
Yeah. That's something you have 13 years in pro- like in elementary and high school. Yeah. You could devote four months of that education to learning how to do basic things in the kitchen. I just think it should be done at home. And I also don't know if it should take 13 years. Maybe that should be a question for next. That's probably a good <laughs> question. Um, for next week. A couple more things I was thinking that should be more emphasis on in school is languages. And I don't mean English or whatever your primary language is. Yeah. I think we should really like emphasize the value of being bilingual or multilingual because in our experience, it's just there's no value placed on it. We start French in grade four, but you graduate not knowing how to string together a sentence. (laughs) Whereas I feel like in a lot of other countries, it's fortunate that people do graduate multilingual, which is cool. Most other countries, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But then for some reason in Canada, they're like, oh, we're a bilingual country. Like, Well, that's all English speaking (laughs) countries. There's a kind of arrogance to it. Yeah. That's uh, we're above that. Mm -hmm. But I think languages need like a lot more emphasis. One, if not two languages should be instructed and like have instruction in the languages. Why not? Do you have any degrowth specific points? Mainly the food thing of learning how to grow your own food. And also I said natural history. So learning about the space because we don't really, like I kind of talked about this last week. Local geography. Local geography. Local geology. Yeah, like Local knowing botany. the yeah. breeds of the animals and the species. Mm-hmm. That's very degrowth because we have these mandated curriculums. But right now it's like, but I can't tell you things about literally the space that I'm in. Yeah, it is kind of funny. I did my first and only course like that when I was 20 in my second or third year of university. Mm-hmm. which was about local birds. Mm-hmm. And now that I'm looking back on it, we were supposed to learn all the birds in the province and also most of the plants which were endemic or um, native to the province. Looking back on it, I'm thinking, why couldn't I have just done this in elementary school? Yeah, it'd be this so fun. effectively bird watching with cue cards mm-hmm. and listening to the sounds and going out and seeing them. Yeah. That just could have been an elementary school course. Yeah, I see a lot of people when they're talking about degrowth education, they're like, we need survival skills. People should know how to make fires and build shelters. I'm like, I don't know if that's actually necessary because it's not something that we really need to do. I just think if you want to learn that, that should be taught at home. I don't think that should be in schools. But I think it's an interest. I think I know what they mean and it's kind of get to know the trees around you. I think it'd be an interesting way of doing it, of like, we're going to go on a camping trip, but I don't think you need to teach kids compass skills. Like those aren't really lost arts. The way that I feel like... um, Maybe a more degrowth, a, a better question than how long should a degrowth education take? Because I, that doesn't really make much sense. No. <laughs> compared to a, a regular education, should be um, what are these tertiary methods of learning outside of the home, outside of the school, mm-hmm. which I think most or many kids don't have nowadays, mm-hmm. which is uh, one of the issues. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, what are some, some other avenues in which they can learn and develop in a degrowth future? And my final degrowth specific school thing is it's about home and school to me, but critical thinking and becoming a good citizen. Parents definitely need to model critical thinking. Oh, we're reading the newspaper, watching the news, talking about bias and stuff with your kids, but also teaching in school, debate, how to articulate yourself, how to look at a variety of sources and not in a, this is how you do research, but in a creating informed citizens so that they can be better voters, better politicians, better business owners, more empathetic, more well-rounded, and yeah, just educated on the philosophy, psychology, and historical context of their thoughts and actions would be useful, but we kind of don't have that right now. Certainly not. <laughs> You're probably wondering what the organism of the week is. <laughs> I certainly am, because we're at the end of the episode now. Yes, I I didn't have a good transition. So this is the this is the bookend. Yes, and t- this week's organism is the dolphin. More specifically, the Baji or Chinese river dolphin. Would you like to describe the image to the listeners, Aaron? Okay, it looks <laughs> like it's like it knows that I'm watching it mm-hmm. and that it's very fed up with my gaze. Um, <laughs> has a very wrinkly peanut head. And a really long nose. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't. I don't know. It looks like a dolphin. 
a dolphin with like kind of a really really long yeah. pinocchio esque. It yeah. looks like it's told some lies. Yeah. Um, I picked this dolphin for two reasons. One, because dolphins are kind of the image in my head for like the animal for education because they're so smart. <laughs> But also, dolphins are basically kids in my eyes. They're so playful. They love to learn. They love to just kind of play and have fun. You always see them swooping in and out of the water. I feel like that might be SeaWorld propaganda that you're referring to. (laughs) No, when you see them in, like, National Geographic out in the ocean, they always... It's true. They do, like, swimming together like that. Yeah. But sadly, this dolphin is functionally extinct. And I know, that's sad. But... That reminded me of kind of like dolphins are just like symbol of learning and fun. And it's we've basically functionally made children's just innate joy and interest in learning extinct. We've been like, oh, you're interested in learning with that stick? Too bad. We're going to learn about the numbers today. Like we don't really encourage exploration and creativity the way I think we need to. But a little bit more about the organism, since that's what it's about is that it's endemic to the Yangtze River. Functionally extinct, it hasn't been seen in 20 years, but there might be some hiding. It is the first dolphin driven to extinction by humans, and in about 50 years, it's one of the only like water megafauna that has gone extinct, because those are a little bit more safe than land megafauna. And the interesting thing about this dolphin to me is that there's kind of a myth surrounding it that there is this like young girl who was like kind of taken out in a boat and she was kind of escaping this like abusive situation and she hopped into the water, but then she reincarnated as one of these dolphins. And so it's like a real symbol of like youth and beauty and like determination and like will. So it's like so beautiful, but then yeah, went extinct. But maybe there's still one hiding. Well, that's a really cheery way to to leave the listeners for the week. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, I had one more thing that I kind of want to talk about next week. It's like kind of related to education because it's like the education side of this actual topic. But have we like talked about the actual history of degrowth at all? No. I'd like to talk about that next week. Okay. We can make it a little like lesson. Sure. So thank you all for listening. If you want to contact us with any ideas, questions, concerns, you can email us and our emails are in the description. We also have the zine, which is an accompaniment to this series, and you can purchase it at www.solacene.org, and we will hand sew them and bind them and send them your way. They have these cute little hand-printed inserts, which are fun to put up as a poster. If you get one before the holidays, you can put it up as a conversation starter, and I'm sure it'll start some conversations. Wow, that's your sales (laughs) pitch for for the holidays. Yes. (laughs) Nice. Thanks for listening. Bye.